and welcome to another episode of the Oxford Online Math Club. My name's James and today I'm joined by Vicky. <laughs> and probably Vicky's cats at some point during this talk today. Um, hi to the people in chat as well. Um, I've seen Alfie, Alex and Ali so far, people whose names start with A. Um, and somebody's just joined with the username X plus IY over there. Hi to uh, people in chat as well. If you want to join in with the live chat that's appearing on screen, underneath our faces under there. That's over on slido.com slash OOMC. Um, if you want to join in there, uh, we're going to be talking about the maths as, as it happens over in that Slido chat. It's lovely to have you with us uh, joining in today. Uh, I hope everyone's having a good day as well. Okay. If the sound's kind of unclear or soft, that could well be the case. Let me try and fix that first before we go. Do, 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 do. So one person says sound is, sound is down. Let me try and fix that in my sound settings. That's a fresh new, fresh new live stream. It's it's hard to see. Give me like two seconds. Vicky, do you want to say anything about what we're doing today? Oh yeah, all right. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me on, James. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I thought we'd work on some number theory because I'm really excited about number theory, basically, and what would be better on a Thursday evening than number theory, um, which is all about properties of whole numbers. Uh, so I've got one of my favourite questions in number theory, and I thought we could work on it together. That's basically the plan. Um, and we're not going to finish the problem completely in the, the course of the hour. That's not the idea. I just want to give you an opportunity to play around with some of the ideas um, explore them for yourselves a bit, hopefully discover some of the thoughts for yourselves rather than uh, me just telling you things. Um, so that is the plan. Um, yeah. How are you doing on the sound? Thank you, Vicky. I think, so someone says James is quiet. So I think you're fine. It's just me. I'm oh. Try talking loudly and we'll see if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you want a, a megaphone, James? Would that be useful? We'll find out. That'll, that'll, that'll be something that's going to come through. James is very quiet. Right, I'm going to fiddle with my mic. I'm going to fiddle with my microphone settings. I'm going to hand over to Vicky. I think is it, can you get us started while I try and? Yeah, out? yeah. Let's do let's do some maths, and um, James can do whatever it is that James needs to do with the sound, and that will be fine. Um, so yeah, grab a pen and paper if you don't have them already, because you might want to do some scribbling here. Hopefully, you will want to do some scribbling. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to try to handwrite this and I apologise in advance about my handwriting. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So the question I thought we'd think about is which numbers can we write as a sum of two square numbers, two squares? I hope that the magic of James's computer system means you can read this and maybe James's computer system somehow addresses my handwriting as well. That would be good. Um, so let, let's just clarify this question a little bit. So when I'm talking about numbers, I mean which uh, positive whole numbers can we write? And when I'm talking about squares, I mean the square of an integer, the square of a whole number. Um, in, for the purposes of the next hour, I'm living in a world that's entirely populated with, with whole numbers, with integers, which is a happy kind of place to be in my experience. So uh, let's just have a look at a couple of examples to make sure that we're thinking about this the same way, and then you can go and think about it as a bit. So is one a sum of two squares? Short pause while you all type your thoughts on Slido and uh, James scratches his chin a bit or something and maybe helps me figure out what you're saying on Slido or maybe I can be something clever to be able to see it on Slido as well. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I can see a one squared plus zero squared. Uh, yeah, so th th somehow your answers are precisely explaining why I wanted to ask this question, um, which is because we have to be clear what, you know, we just need to agree what we're doing here. So I think that one is a sum of two squares because it's one squared plus zero squared. Um, so I completely understand that you might not want to count zero as a square number. That's fine, but do that at a different day. Don't do that today. We're going to count zero um, as a square just because it's kind of handy. So um, 
squares here, I mean square of an integer. Um, so one is the, uh, a sum of two squares of integers. Uh, is two a sum of two squares? Short typing pause. Yes, I mean, I sort of agree with the yes, but I think the one plus one is is sort of more informative. I feel like that gives a reason rather than just a yes. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Two is one squared plus one squared. You didn't really need uh, me to kind of help spell that out. Um, what I sort of want to do is keep going for a bit, looking at numbers and teching, mm, is this a sum of two squares, to gather some data to then be able to kind of look and try to make some patterns. And I can see that some people in chat are already maybe kind of trying to think more generally, trying to make conjectures, trying to predict, oh, this number might be, or this number might not be, or these types of numbers might be, or might not be, or whatever, um, which is great. Let's have a little bit of a pause while you gather some data. So let's think about, say, the numbers from one to 50. Uh, grab your piece of paper and have a think. Are all of those numbers a sum of two squares? Are there any that aren't a sum of two squares? Are there any numbers um, between one and 50 that can be written as a sum of two squares in more than one way? Um, so I'm not going to count negative. I'm not going to say, well, one is minus one square plus zero square. That doesn't feel interestingly different. Let's, let's ignore the negatives, but sort of interestingly different ways. So maybe um, I will kind of stop talking for a minute or so and just give you a bit of time to uh, start thinking about gathering some data. And I encourage you to record what the squares are. Don't just record yes or no. You know, if you can write a number as a sum of two squares, write down what they are, because that might be useful. And then when we've got some data, we can have a look for patterns and conjectures and stuff. Um, so I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, if you're spotting patterns and conjectures already, that's great. Hold those thoughts. We will, we will come back to those really soon. But let's get some data first so that we can um, do some in kind of exploring. Suggestions in the chat are perhaps that maybe we could do all square numbers, um, Rebecca F. I'm spotting a pattern that I think that zero is possible, one is possible, maybe all square numbers. Um, and Raphael says we can also say any number that is one or two greater than a square is the sum of two squares, um, says Raphael. I think, I think possibly Interesting. any number that's one or two, etc, greater than a square is the sum of two squares possibly? I think I think I might I might kind of pause on that one for a moment, and yeah, we'll we'll come back to some of these things. Um, yeah, so so have a moment to keep looking at the data, um, keep sharing those thoughts, and I, I will collect together some of these kind of ideas and patterns and so on um, that you're noticing. Um, but let's just have a bit of data gathering. Still really quiet. That that's James's coming plan to give you thinking time. And that's definitely not that he's having technical problems with his sound at all. That's definitely a, a kind of strategy decision. <laughs> Are we doing compare our microphones? James and I have matching microphones, I think. Mm. Mine has the kind of pointless thing on it that doesn't really do anything. Yeah, well, that is an advantage uh, at the moment. Um, so you're busy working out which numbers are sums of two squares and which aren't, and I would love to give you loads of time to do that, but James said that I wasn't allowed to kind of stay here doing this all night. Apparently we have to like stop at some point or something. Um, so James and I did a bit of homework earlier and kind of figured this out with some numbers already, which I'm hoping James might have in a kind of here's one we prepared earlier slide. So look away now if you don't want to look or something. No, don't look away now. <sighs> look at that. We can't hear James, but he does really good things with like putting up slides. Thanks, James. <laughs> you even know which way to turn to point at your sli uh, the slide. <laughs> um, if you've already got some data, you might want to cross reference. If you find a mistake on the slide, please tell us. It's possible. We're human. Um, there are there is a number on here that's a sum of two squares in two genuinely different ways, right? 25 is, because it's five squared plus zero squared, and it's four squared plus three squared. I mean, how exciting is that? 25, there's something special going on there. 
And then there were some numbers that are definitely sums of two squares because I wrote down how they were a sum of two squares. And then there were some gaps, um, which I think were not sums of two squares. That's why I left them blank because I didn't know what to write because they weren't. Um, so yeah, if you if you spot a mistake in the data on the slide, this is a good moment to point it out because if we we're looking at the wrong data, this is going to get really confusing. Um, but assuming the data seems okay, maybe have a look and see what conjectures you can make, what predictions you can make, uh, what patterns you notice. Um, I will have a look at the, the chat in a moment because I know there are some really great ideas coming in. Um, the data from one to 48, it's not so much data, right? It's not that many numbers. So it might be that you come up with some projectors and you think, well, actually, I'd like to just test this particular slightly larger number to see whether that seems to stack up or whatever. So you know, do, do, do those things if that seems helpful. Um, if you can hear the cat, that's a good sign. It means that the microphone's working really well, although it's not so great that the cat is in the way. Um, so uh, let me just give you a moment to kind of look, see what you notice. Um, see what you can come up with. I tried switching my microphones around. Let's see if that's good. Um, <laughs> maybe Vicky can't hear me now. Um, uh, no, I, I, I can hear you, James, but you sound somehow different. So something changed. <laughs> uh, there's a suggestion that below 2n squared there might be we could count the combinations of squares that there are, uh, how many ways there are to combine them together. I'm reading out the top suggestion in chat below here. Interesting. OK, so the idea is here is that I'm thinking, well, how many possibilities are there for the first square and the second square? And then kind of, mm, OK, and uh, yeah, that, that idea that um, some could be repeated is interesting. Um, yeah, so let, let me pick out some more of these ideas because there's lots of interesting things here. Um, so I see some su suggestions about um, Pythagorean triples. Does everybody know this phrase? So a Pythagorean triple is three maybe positive integers that satisfy Pythagoras' equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So they could be the sides of a right angle triangle. That's what a Pythagorean triple means. It means uh, it could be the sides of um, a right angle triangle. Um, so uh, we have a suggestion that maybe all squares, every square is a sum of two squares. That seems like an interesting one. Um, does a sum of two squares always have to be even? Uh, interesting question. Uh, there seems to be a bit of discussion going on about that one. Um, so that's good. Uh, one of the things I encourage you to do is to make conjectures that you're not sure about, to be bold. And uh, someone once said to me, if, if all your conjectures are true, you're not being bold enough. So coming up with conjectures and then going, oh, actually, okay, that's not quite right. But, but then can you rescue that somehow? Is there something that you can salvage from that conjecture, even though as it stands, you could find a counterexample? Um, if n is a square, n plus any square number less than n will be a sum of two squares. Uh, interesting. Um, yeah, so we've got a few ideas along those lines, every square and then every square plus one or plus four or something. Interesting. Um, maybe the numbers that can be written as a sum of two squares in two ways are the Pythagorean triple kind of things, I guess, maybe inspired by seeing that five squared is three squared plus four squared. Uh, interesting. Uh, okay, so we have a suggestion that we could write three as a sum of two squares, if only we kind of tried harder, uh, slash allowed ourselves to use complex numbers. Well, I sort of agree, but that's just a different game. Okay, so I've picked the rules of today's game. The rules of today's game are the squares have to be squares of integers. Um, so yes, but also at the same time, no. Uh, interesting. So, What's sorry, did I just talk about powers again? of two? Have we talked about powers? Yeah, of I was two? just I was just oh, getting right. to that. Yeah, interesting. I was just going to have a look at the data. I'm I'm toggling between things on my uh, laptop here, so I can't look at the conjectures and the, the data at the same time. So let's see. Conjectures that powers of two could be written as some two squares. So let's see. One, yes. Two, yes. Four, yes. Eight, yes. Sixteen, yes. Thirty-two, yes. Sixty-four. I don't know. It's too big. Oh, hang on. Maybe maybe I do know about 64, actually, because it's a square number and somebody mentioned about square numbers earlier on. Interesting. OK, so it's looking good for powers of two on the basis of this data. Interesting. Uh, OK, is so somebody's put all divisible by two or primes of the form 4K plus one. And I'm just trying to I can think of two different ways of interpreting that. And I'm not quite sure what you meant. So one might be 
every number that's divisible by two is a sum of two squares. And I'm a little bit cautious about that looking at this data. Uh, or maybe, um, maybe it's saying something different that if you're a sum of two squares, then you are divisible by two or by a prime of this form. I'm not exactly sure there. Um, so one of the things I'm picking out here um, is how would you go about gathering this? This data. So <laughs> one, one possible strategy for gathering this data today has been wait for James to put up the slide that had the data. Um, that's not a massively robust way of gathering the data. Um, so I guess I can think of a couple of ways of doing it. So one would be to go through each number in turn. I mean, I started with one and two on my tablet and then I sort of gave up, but I could keep going three, four, five and just kind of pick a number, think very hard. Oh, can I write it as a sum of two squares? Yes, I can. No, I can't. Okay, next number, think very hard. Can I write it as a sum of two squares? Yes, I can. No, I can't. Whatever, move on. Um, well, somebody's suggesting um, in chat is that a different strategy might be pick a square number and then add to it all of the possible square numbers. And then I guess I could pick it. So I could do like three squared plus zero squared, three squared plus one squared, three squared plus two squared, three squared plus three squared. That's a real tongue twister. And then I could pick like four squared as my first one and go, OK, I'll do a four squared plus zero squared, four squared plus one squared and so on. Um, so I guess at the end of doing that process, we'd have written down all of this, um, the sums of two squares. And then anything that we haven't done isn't a sum of two squares. So that would be another way of doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, somebody said we could do it on a computer. Well, yes, but you still have to decide what process your computer is going to use for doing it. So I guess these kind of different algorithms that you might get your computer to do. Um, interesting uh let's see every square number plus two cannot be written as a sum of two squares mm. let me have a think uh i'm gonna have a look at the data here let's see uh one square plus two is three that's not two squared plus two is six that's not three square plus two is 11 that's not Four squared plus two is 18, that's not. Five squared plus two is 27, that's not. Six squared plus two is 38, that's not. 49 squared plus 51 is bigger than 48, and so it's not on the slide, so who knows, really? I mean, I just don't know. Interesting idea, uh, who knows? Uh, so. One day some... point that I might have fixed my microphone. Um, I'm going to try talking oh. in break. Um, I've just seen someone in chat say that I think it's a proof that the powers of two work. I can't remember. Did we, did we prove that all the powers of two work? Or... I don't think I've proved anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think someone in chat might have, Vicky. Um, I'm ah, read okay. Let, let me, um, should I have a look? Yeah, go on. It says, it says, there's a danger of me reading it out that people probably can't hear me, but if two to the n is non-square, it can be expressed as two to the n, two times two to the n minus one i think that n minus one is all in the exponent where two to the n minus one is a square number um if two to the n is not square um if yeah okay if two to the n is non-square then n is not even so n minus one is even and that one is a square and i guess the the last bit is i guess that means that either your powers of two are square or it's twice the previous square if it's twice the previous square we can add together two copies of the previous square I think that works. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, so powers of two. And I noticed that there's a bit of discussion going on about powers of five. So um, that seems like an interesting thing to explore. Does that work out the same or is that kind of differently? I guess the the argument about two to the n when n is odd relied importantly on the fact that then you've got two times two to the n minus one. And that two would be a five if you were doing powers of um, five. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, so somebody suggested about Pythagorean triples that they would definitely be able to be written in, uh, well, I guess at least two ways, because the, the if you've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the c squared would be a square, so it would be c squared plus zero squared, and it would also be a squared plus b squared. Um, so there's a kind of uh, justification there, which is lovely. Uh, questions that I now have in my mind, could there be... Uh, a number that's the largest in a Pythagorean triple that could be written as the sum of two squares in more than two ways. And also, are there numbers that aren't coming from Pythagorean triples that could be written as the sum of two squares in more than one way? Hmm. Uh, oh, I see some algebra. You've had it both ways around as well. I was happy to think that 
I was happy thinking, oh, the Pythagorean triples can be written in two ways, maybe. But I was feeling, I was feeling clever. Well, I'm happy about that too. I just have more questions. I mean, yeah. don't you feel like your life as a mathematician is full of having more questions, James? I feel like I always have more questions. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm always surprised. There's so many different questions you could ask that I hadn't thought of the question the other way around for that one. For Is that the only time you can write it as the sum of t? For the only time you can write it as the sum of two squares in two different ways. Um, but yeah, I guess that is a natural ask the opposite question. So someone is talking here about um, what happens if I take a sum of two squares and multiply it by two. So if I've got a squared plus b squared, and multiply it by two. And I don't know whether this one has appeared on the screen. I, I'm trying to look at too many things at once. Uh, but they've done some algebra to argue that it is a sum of two squares, because look, algebra. So if n is a sum of two squares, then so is 2n. That seems like an interesting observation. Does that also handle powers of two? Could you use that result to do powers of two as a kind of special case, maybe? Uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, there's also discussion about 18. Can, James, can you can you fill me in on 18? Oh, I know what this was about. This I've just remembered this one. This was the square numbers plus two. Ah, right, okay. Did I forget 16 somehow when I was looking at the data earlier on or just, I might have messed up, sorry. Yeah, I agree. 16 is four square plus zero square. 16 is a, a square and oh look, 16 plus two is a sum of two squares. Hmm. Interesting. So there are lots of good ideas coming in here. Uh, how about I switch to my tablet for a bit and try to summarize some of the key things that we might have come across so far. Do you think that would be a good plan, James? Okay, so. I guess this is like a list of conjectures and then we might decide that we've proved some of them. So conjecture, uh, a square is a sum of two squares. Um, I feel sure that that was a conjecture that came in at some point. And it's important to me somehow that we try to capture things that some people might think are obvious as well as things that seem a bit more tenuous because somehow articulating these things out loud, thinking them through can be really helpful. So if you're looking and thinking, oh, but I thought that was obvious. Well, maybe it's obvious to you, but it's still worth kind of uh, being clear about this. Um, and then I guess we also do a sort of a building on that. We had numbers that are uh, square plus one, four, nine, and so on are sums of two squares. Uh, we had something that powers of two are sums of two squares. We had um, the largest number in a Pythagorean triple is a sum of two squares in at least two ways because I'm a mathematician and I want to be ultra precise that it might be more than two we don't know who knows uh, we had that if n is a square uh, no sorry sum of two squares that's what I meant to write sum of two squares then so is 2n um, have I missed any key things that we've talked about already, James? Powers of five? Like oh, was the conjecture that powers of five are all... Uh, yeah, there was something about powers of two, two and something about powers of five separately. I'll tell you what, why don't I squeeze that kind of in under here and that saves me some writing. That's kind of lazy, but you know what I mean. That's not powers of two fifths, by the way, just to be clear. Hardly <laughs> any of them work. Conversation. Yeah, hardly any of them, exactly. <laughs> two fifths to the zero works, but that doesn't count. Um, have we actually written down um, a proof that uh, a square is a sum of two squares?
there's some discussion about whether this is somehow obvious or it's a tautology or something. I don't think it is a tautology. I think it's a thing. But I guess the point here is that n squared is n squared plus zero squared. That's that's kind of the justification. So I guess we might give ourselves a tick that that conjecture seems true. We can prove it. Um, and I guess similarly, numbers that are square plus another square, we can sort of see that we'd be able to do something like that. Um, we did have an argument for powers of two. So it's kind of tick for uh, an argument of powers of two. James helped read out that one. Um, have we had an argument about powers of five or is that a, a work in progress? That's, that's maybe still on the list. So question mark for five, maybe we can come back to this. The largest number in a Pythagorean triple is the sum of two squares in at least two ways. Yeah, we definitely had some reasoning for that. That was kind of C squared is A squared plus B squared and it's C squared plus zero squared. I'm being kind of shorthand in my writing down reasons here. Uh, if N is a sum of two squares, then so is two N. I feel like I did see uh, a reason for that, but I don't think I, we read it out. So maybe I will... Uh, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, let's see what I can find the algebra to write down for you. So I think the idea here was that if we had a squared plus b squared, when we multiplied it by two, that would be a plus b all squared plus a minus b all squared. That's the claim. Short pause while we all do multiplying out and think about it. Let's see. On the right hand side, I'm going to get an a squared in both of those squares. I'm going to get b squared in both of those squares. That's looking good for two times a squared plus b squared. And then I guess on the right hand side, I've got a plus 2ab from the first square. And then by magic, a minus 2ab. Uh, it's not magic, it's maths. A minus 2ab in the second square. And they cancel. And I don't know whether that's magic or maths, really. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I agree with this algebra. This looks good to me. So uh, I guess we get a tick for that one. Um, so I think we still have powers of five floating in the ether as a possible conjecture. Um, the thing about squares plus two, unfortunately, we had a counter example. Um, are there some more conjectures that we might come up with? Uh, I don't know whether it's more helpful to have this list of conjectures on the screen or to have the data set on the screen. I don't know. What do you think, James? Since you're in charge of what shows up anyway, <laughs> it doesn't really matter what I think. Or I know, I mean, your switch between the two in some sort of nauseating way like that. Ooh. Like, um, okay, not too nauseating, please. Okay. I don't want to feel seasick. I feel like that and then that. That's too much, isn't it? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't set up a split screen to have both of them. Conjectures, numbers. No, I can't stop. <laughs> Um, yeah, why don't we see whether there are some more conjectures? Some suggestions mm. in chat. Um, I've been trying to keep up, but chat's very clever and saying lots of different things all at once. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's very exciting. Oh, look, somebody's talked about prime factors. Somebody's talked about congruence mod eight. Uh, somebody's conjecturing that if n and m are both sums of two squares, then so is n m. I think I saw some algebra for that at some point in chat. Um, I think SV yeah. had some algebra for multiplying. They said frac for fraction a bit, but I think I know what they meant. Um, mm. A squared plus B squared. Oh no, I'm confused. Oh, maybe they did. I saw something about Sorry. sums of two squares being equal. So you a number that was the sum of two squares in two ways and then rearranging with a difference of two squares. I, was that the thing? I spotted that, which looked interesting, but also it involved a fraction. And I had a slight moment of panic because I was sort of living in this nice world of whole numbers. And then somebody no fractions. mentioned fractions. Um, somebody's just said that they think that maybe three, six or seven more than a multiple of eight isn't possible. I, I mm. guess they mean isn't possible, like they can't write it as the sum of two squares. Well, let's like... let's have a look at the data and see whether that seems plausible. Yeah, data. Where are the numbers that are three more than a multiple of eight? Wow. Well, later, here's three yeah. is three more than a multiple of eight. <laughs> and so yeah. it's six and six seven. is not three more than a multiple of eight. 
Oh, six is six more than multiple of eight, though. Sorry, there. <laughs> yeah. I oh, see. Okay, I was just going to look at the numbers that were three more than multiple oh, yeah. of eight for a moment and just just do them one at a time. So I think that's like three, eleven, nineteen, twenty-seven, thirty-five, and forty-three, and so on, isn't it? And almost as though we planned this and it wasn't completely coincidental, there are eight rows of these um, numbers here, um, which is kind of handy because it means that numbers are kind of lined up in rows based on the remainder when you divide by eight. So the bottom row, those are multiples of eight, and the top row are one more than a multiple of eight, and then row three is three more than a multiple of eight, and row six is six more than a multiple of eight, and row seven is seven more than a multiple of eight, which I suspect that some of you noticed. And I agree, on the basis of this data, it looks a lot as though numbers that are three, six, or seven more than a multiple of eight and not a sum of two squares. Uh, the cat's very excited about that as well, because she heard somebody mention multiples of eight. Go away, cat. Just go away, okay? Uh, so, uh, I guess that would be a good one to think about. Could we justify that? Could we justify that numbers th three, six, or seven more than a multiple of eight are never a sum of two squares? I mean, is that actually true, or is that just a feature of the numbers uh, one to 48? Hmm, don't know. That's maybe something for you to think about. Um, let me see what else is uh, coming in here. Uh, okay, so somebody is suggesting maybe these things have to be integers. I'm not sure that I follow that, but maybe I've misunderstood. Conversation something. about the fractions from before, sorry. <laughs> Yes. I no, I, I get that. I don't. Yeah. I think it's something in the uh, a little bit further down. Um, anything that has remained a three when divided by four wouldn't work because and then there's a they've said some reason, but it's in it says one slash zero mod four, which knows. Um, OK, I'm, I'm assuming that's not dividing by zero because that would be very distressing. I'm assuming I'll that one or I'll highlight it so it jumps to the top. I saw this one earlier on. Um, Anything Squares are like... zero or one mod four. Ooh. That seems like an interesting idea. Is it true? Does everyone know what mod four means, or should we should we explain? So, being zero mod four means you're a multiple of four, and what being one mod four means you're one more than a multiple of four. It's a, it's a shorthand for this thing we're saying quite a lot of being so so many more than a multiple of something else. Yeah. Well, given that we've got eight rows on the grid, I'm wondering whether we should think about the squares mod eight rather than mod four. So if you like, which rows are the squares in on this grid? Pause while people want to think about that. Squares, you say? Oh. Can, I, can I circle the squares? Yeah, that's a good idea. If you have like advanced colouring skills on the slide, wow. I would never describe my skills as advanced, especially my colouring skills. Uh, 18 is not square. Oh, this is dangerous. <laughs> Four is square. What is I don't... Uh, this, this this feels to me not the most convenient way of identifying the squares. Oh, yeah, I should be doing them in order. One, four, nine, sixteen. <laughs> I was reading left to right, and I should have been reading top to bottom. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think that's more and natural. And not on the board. Okay, I found some squares. Yeah, nice. Uh, the squares appear to be in the top row, the fourth row, and the bottom row. Is it true that every square is 0, 1, or 4 mod 8? Or is that a consequence of the fact that we're only looking at data from 1 to 48, and if we went further, it would look different? Pause while you have a think. So one way to think about this might be to think about um, each number, mod 8, and kind of where it ends up if you square it. So if you take a multiple of 8 and square it, you get a multiple of 8. If you take a number that's one more than a multiple of 8 and square it, you get something that's one more than a multiple of 8. You can do algebra and check. If you take something two more than a multiple of 8 and square it, you get something that's four more than a multiple of 8. You just kind of keep going through all of the cases. And I think that you'll only ever end up with a multiple of eight or something one more than a multiple of eight or something four more than a multiple of eight. Like if you take something three more than a multiple of eight and square it, sort of wraps around in the algebra or something, you end up with something that's one more than a multiple of eight. So I think that the squares are in rows one, four, and eight on this slide, genuinely for all time, uh, not only for the numbers for one to 48. And I think that means we can think about what happens when we add two of them, because there are only three types of numbers. So let's see, if I, Add two multiples of eight, I get a multiple of eight. 
If I add a multiple of eight and something one more than a multiple of eight, I get something one more than a multiple of eight. If I add something that's a multiple of eight to something four more than a multiple of eight, I get something four more than a multiple of eight. If I add two numbers that are one more than a multiple of eight, I get something that's two more than a multiple of eight. If I add something that's one more than a multiple of eight to something four more than a multiple of eight, I get something that's five more than a multiple of eight. And if I add two numbers that are four more than a multiple of eight, I get a multiple of eight. And I think that the important thing there is what I didn't say, not what I did say, because at no point in that output did we have, you get something that's three, six or seven more than multiple eight. I think that shows that those rows are empty. I agree with that. I'm gonna write that on the list of conjectures and give us a tick, even though you can't see the list of conjectures. Uh, a number three, six or seven mod eight, three, six or seven more than a multiple of eight, uh, is not a sum of two squares. And the kind of shorthand reason is squares mod eight are zero, one, and four. Tick. Nice. That's kind of good, because that means we can eliminate a whole bunch of possibilities uh, straight away. If I give you some massive number and it happens to be three more than a multiple of eight, which is really easy for you to check. You can go, oh no, it can't possibly be a sum of two squares, like really quickly, and I'll be super impressed. Um, that's great. I guess this doesn't completely answer the question because there are still all of the other numbers in the world, the numbers that are zero, one, two, four, or five more than a multiple of eight. And some of them are sums of two squares and some of them aren't sums of two squares as we saw in the data. So the fact that I can see people beavering away um, on other things as well, uh, is great. So uh, we've got some discussion going on about numbers that don't work. Maybe they're primes. There's some stuff about multiples of three, multiples of seven, um, or maybe the multiples of seven are not sums of two squares, but then James kind of points out that seven squared is a multiple of seven, and that is a sum of two squares. Um, so there's some discussion going on about powers of five. So uh, I think this is an induction argument. So we know that one, five to the zero is a sum of two squares. We know that five is a sum of two squares. And then the plan is to multiply by five squared. Nice, that seems like a nice idea. And I feel like we could adapt that idea to handle other things as well. I think that means that if you take n that is a sum of two squares and you multiply it by a square, I think that means the answer would still be a sum of two squares for similar kind of um, thing. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question here about, um, oh yeah, can I name call who came up with conjectures? Yeah, sorry, I think that's too, too advanced cognitively for me. And also some people are anonymous and I, I think I'll just get confused, I'm afraid, <laughs> sorry. I'm um, seeing your name. To know, are, are these conjectures that we're coming up with, uh, what's going to happen with them? Are you going to publish them academically? Is this? <laughs> uh, well, I think I think James is going to publish this video on YouTube or something afterwards. Um, yeah, we might not be writing them up and sending them off for a journal, though. Um, I'm not trying to get you to do work for me that I'm then going to claim as my own. Uh, this question, does saying that squares have to be 0 or 1 mod 4 also mean the same as 0 or 1 or 4 mod 8? That's a good question. I think that 5 is 1 mod 4, but it's 5 mod 8. So I think that saying that squares have to be 0, 1 or 4 mod 8 is more precise, is sort of more information than saying squares is zero or one mod four, because I'm sort of saying, well, a square can't be five mod eight. And that was quite important in that argument for saying that we couldn't get six as a sum of two squares, for example, or things that are six mod eight as a sum of two squares, because if we'd had five, then we could have said, oh, that was five plus one. So I guess if you think mod four, you can rule out numbers that are three mod four, a number that's three mod four can't be a sum of two squares by thinking mod four, but a number that's two mod four, we can't say anything about that from a mod four argument, but the number, a number that's two mod four might be two mod four, might be two mod eight, or it might be six mod eight, and we can say something about the six mod eight. So we're sort of doing a bit more 
uh, it's ref a bit more of a refined, sort of precise statement if we go mod eight as well. I hope that sort of answered that. Um, so I'm wondering whether we can go back to uh, a conjecture that came up earlier on that I saw mentioned, which was uh, if n and m are sums of two squares, then so is n m. Because that feels like an interesting conjecture. Actually, I think we've done one special case of this already, haven't we? Because I think that not the previous one on my list, but the one before. If n is the sum of two squares, then so is 2n. I think if the bottom conjecture is true, if it's the true that if n and m are sums of two squares and so is n m, then specialising to the case where m is two, bracket, which we know is the sum of two squares, that would handle the twice the sum of two squares is the sum of two squares, but also obviously it would do a whole bunch more. If it's true, <laughs> if it's not true in general, then that's not going to help us so much. Um, so we have a short pause. I encourage you to kind of focus specifically on that conjecture for a moment. Just see whether we, you've got some data there. You might want to go further than 48 because there aren't that many products up to 48. Just see whether you can unpick that one a little bit more. So this is just the last NM. Um, and just the last conjecture about NM, which is just on the screen. I think we've got it. I think we've got it on the screen and it's fine. Yeah, oh. yeah if, if n and m are sums of two squares, then so is their product. So the product of two sums of two squares is also a sum of two squares. Does that seem true? Can you find a counterexample? Can you prove it? Um, I think um, the trying to guess approach is somebody said something earlier while people are typing their ideas. I'm just going to chat. Um, someone said something earlier about checking things with computers and just sort of checking all the numbers, keep sort of churning through. Um, which is tricky, of course, because there's a lot of numbers and... Yeah, there's like loads. loads. <laughs> Computers are actually quite slow compared to how many numbers there are. Um, but something I, I liked was when Vicky was doing the, the strategy of talking about remainders, more, remainders when you divide by eight, um, so looking at all the different cases, there's only, so, there's only a few different remainders when you divide by eight. So you can, you can go through all of them. And there's a bit where Vicky had to go through lots of different cases to say out loud. But it was a finite list of cases to get through. So I guess that's sort of, I haven't really thought about it, but that's one of the strengths of this method of looking at things remainder something else, that instead of having infinitely many numbers, you've only got finitely many remainders to, to work with. As you check yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. Like working mod eight is lovely because somehow there are only really eight different things, mod eight, and eight's small enough that I could check them. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and Fun. Uh, Thank you, for like many cases is good. Also, thank you, Pierre de Fermat, for proving a point. Um, somebody's asked if, if somebody else is a real person. Um, you can set your name on Slido to be anything, um, including Pierre de Fermat, who is a, a mathematician from Hungary. I'm assuming yeah. that Pierre de Fermat is a regular on the maths club and, and comes up with this comment every week. Am I assuming incorrectly? I'm it's, just sort of a matter of time getting. before the, 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 the classic Pierre de Fermat joke. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we love you, Pierre de Fermat. Um, uh, okay, someone is suggesting we could use quadratic residues, um, which sounds like an interesting thought if you uh, know about quadratic residues, but that's a little bit more than I was planning to do uh, today. So quadratic, well, I mean, we sort of have used quadratic residues already. I just didn't call them quadratic residues. Quadratic residues is jargon for the squares mod something. So when I say the squares mod a to zero, or one and four, I'm kind of saying those are the quadratic residues, or maybe we don't count zero as a quadratic residue in some technical detail, whatever. Um, so we sort of have been using quadratic residues there, just I just didn't call them that. Uh, computers can never prove everything pure mathematics can prove. Um, that's an interesting conjecture. Can you prove it? Um, quadratic residues. There are lots of really serious people putting a lot of time and thought into exactly this question. Can you get computers to prove stuff by themselves? It's a really interesting question. Um, but to plagiarize um, something somebody in the set, chat said earlier, I think this session is too small to contain it. Can't plug quadratic residues. Quadratic residues All right. are what we talked about in Oxford Online Maths Club, season one, episode zero. <laughs> so if you scroll all the way down on the Maths Club homepage, there's a link to the homepage at the bottom of this video and in the YouTube description. If you scroll all the way down to the very first episode we did in 2021, um, I had a go at explaining quadratic residues in that video so long ago. 
So I think I've got a proof that if n and m are sums of two squares, and so is n m. So how about I show you what I claim is a proof, and then you can give me feedback on it. Is that a plan? I'm going to scroll down a bit, so I've got a bit of blank space if we want to go back and have more conjectures um, later. So claim uh, the product of two sums of two squares is a sum of two squares. So that's what I'm trying to show. That's what I mean when I write claim. I mean, uh, that's what I'm going to prove. And here's my attempt at a proof. I'm going to take a sum of two squares, a squared plus b squared, and I'm going to multiply it by another sum of two squares, c squared plus d squared. And I claim that this is equal to ac minus bd all squared plus ac, uh, not ac, sorry, ad plus bc all squared. That's my attempt at a proof. Uh, I would be interested in your feedback on question one, do you believe this proof? And question two, do you like this proof? So those are two different questions. Uh, over to you. Do you believe this proof? Do you like this proof? Someone earlier described your proof, um, looking at the remainders when you divide by eight as the quickest proof they'd ever seen. And I think it's really great that in the same session, we've managed to show them an even quicker proof. <laughs> um, well, if it is a proof, right, we're still waiting oh, for right. feedback on whether people believe this proof, right? Oh, please, keep jumping. Uh, and there's a different bit of algebra in chat from Alfie. Um, Alfie's multiplied out the squares. Um, and Alfie's, I think, written the right hand side is the sum of four squares. So I think Alfie's proved ah. that. Um, I think Alfie's algebra proves that um, the product of two things that are sum of two squares is the product of. It looks like four it's squares sum of to me. Four squares. Um, yeah, it looks like four squares to me. But that also seems like relevant algebra for thinking about my claim, my, my attempt to prove. Okay, someone both believes and likes my proof. That's model. nice. <laughs> I think that's the only person to give me feedback so far. Can we can we have some more feedback? I'm doing a poll. <laughs> you believe my proof, do you like my proof? I feel like around the world at the moment, there's lots and lots of people busy multiplying out brackets furiously. Oh, we've got a poll. I can only see two options on my screen. Oh. Is that because they don't all fit? A little bit, yeah. Hang on. Well, there's a compromise here. Oh, no. Oh, my compromise doesn't work. Oh, I see. OK, there we go. <laughs> so you're not allowing people to like it but not believe it. I feel oh, like right. that's Should an important, that be an option? But a philosophical point. I feel like that is, at least oh, in theory, yeah. possible. Someone in chat has told me they believe it, they like it if it's true. So it's a conditional. I definitely, I definitely, I can think of a maths problem where my first attempt at an answer to the problem I liked a lot, even though I didn't believe it. Um, Did it turn out to be true? Or... The result was true. The <laughs> argument I wrote down was not true, but I really liked it, and then I found a way, a way to fix it. Oh, okay. So it wasn't quite the first argument I thought of, but somehow the fact that I liked it so much made me think I should, I should press on with this and try to make it work. Okay, um, I'm trying to work out whether I can guess the denominator of the number of people voting based on um, <laughs> the, the percentages. Uh, okay, I think there's lots of people believing and liking it. Uh, what's your vote, James? My vote is I believe it, but I don't like it. What do you, what's your vote? Uh, I think I believe it. I feel like I like it. Um, okay. I think it answers What do you like about it? Uh, I can check it very quickly, and it well, you could just you know tells me tells me that oh yeah, it was true, and I don't have to think anymore. No, maybe I can see why you maybe don't like it very much now that I say. I it. like the fact that it's true. I mean, you can multiply all of the algebra out, and everything cancels out nicely, and that's kind of satisfying. And then and then we know that this thing that we thought might be true actually is true, and that's cool. Um, the thing that I don't like about it is that it gives me no idea why it's true. It feels like. Just, oh, rabbit out of a hat. Oh, here's some algebraic expression that came from nowhere. And um, somehow, yeah, that feels a bit unsatisfactory to me. It sort of, 
it's sort of magic and i want to i want to know yeah where where did this come from let me tell you where it came from this is going to be really quick okay so i don't know whether this will make sense or not but i'll do my best really quickly because james said this session was finitely long um so let's talk about complex numbers um shout out to x plus i y who i guess has been waiting for this moment um, so what is a complex number? It's an expression of the form something like a plus b i, where i is the square root of minus one. Uh, I know loads of you know what complex numbers are already. This is just kind of super quick in case you don't know uh, what complex numbers are already. Uh, what is the square root of minus one? Who knows? I mean, let's not have an existential crisis about it. It's just some number that if you square it, you get minus one. So if I have a complex number like a plus b i, uh, I can do things like multiply it by other complex numbers. So if I do uh, 3 plus i times uh, 2 minus 5i, I suddenly wish I'd done some of this algebra or arithmetic beforehand rather than doing it now. 11 minus 15. I was, I, I was going to do slightly more steps here, oh, just right, for anyone who hasn't done this before. So I'm just going to multiply out brackets in the usual way. So I get 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2i minus 15i minus 5i squared, I think. And James is going to squeak if I go wrong. 15i, there we go. Just checking, James, just checking. Uh, but i squared is minus one, so this is uh, the minus five i squared becomes plus five. So I think this is eleven minus thirteen i. How we're we looking? Uh, is that okay? Maybe. Does that sort of explain how to multiply out complex numbers? Here's a way of thinking about complex numbers: we can draw them on a two-dimensional diagram. Like the real numbers live on the real line, which is obviously horizontal morally no i don't know it just is horizontal uh and then i've got this other axis where i can record the imaginary part so here is three plus i uh it has real part three and imaginary part well one so kind of vertically i get plus i there and two minus five i is going to be like down here or something so I can draw complex numbers on this two-dimensional thing, which is called an argand diagram, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and then I can ask how long is a complex number? And that's called the modulus of a complex number. So the modulus of three plus i, that's like the length of this line from the origin to three plus i. And I know how to work out that length because I've got this right angle triangle where the base is three, and that uh, the, the vertical thing is one. And uh, I've got this right angle triangle and I could do Pythagoras. We've already uh, had a uh, mention of Pythagoras earlier on. So I think the length of this is going to be the square root of three squared plus one squared, which is the square root of 10. We all good? Maybe, hopefully. And I could work out the length, the modulus of two minus five i. I think that's going to be the square root of two squared plus minus five squared, which seems to be the square root of 29, if I've done my arithmetic correctly, maybe. Um, why do modulus and absolute values have the same symbol? Uh, great question. Well, if you're a real number, you could work out its modulus in this way, and I think you get the same answer. So this is like generalizing what we do um, with um, real numbers, but kind of doing it with complex numbers too. So here's a question. What happens if I take the complex number a plus b i and I multiply it by the complex number c plus d i? Uh, like, uh, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to multiply out a plus b i times c plus d i. And I say I'm going to give you 10 seconds and then I forgot to like look at my watch when I started. So this is like not remotely 10 seconds because I've got no idea. I think this is a c minus b d that minus b d because I get a b i times d i and then I get an i squared and that's minus one remember. And then I think I'm going to get plus AD plus um, BCI. I did that quite quickly because I've had practice, basically. Don't worry if you took longer, that's completely fine. 
Do these look like things you've seen before? So what happens if I take the modulus of A plus BI? Well, let's take the square of the modulus, because otherwise we get these annoying square roots and stuff. And I multiply it by the modulus of C plus DI. Well, the modulus of A plus BI squared, that's A squared plus B squared, right? I don't know why I'm writing this there. That's not a sensible place to write this. Let's write it here. This is a squared plus b squared times c squared plus d squared. And the modulus of a plus b i times c plus d i squared is, oh, look, if I go back to this nice expression for the product, that's a c minus b d squared, the square of the real part, plus the square of the imaginary part, a d plus b c squared. And that mysterious algebra that I wrote down earlier on, that was my attempt at a proof, which won't fit on as well, but there it was, was saying that the square of the modulus of A plus BI times the square of the modulus of C plus DI is the square of the modulus of A plus BI times C plus DI. So somehow to prove that modulus and multiplication sort of work nicely, you still have to do the algebra at some point in your life. But really what this fact is recording is this deeper underlying thought about what happens when you multiply complex numbers. And there's a reason, and I can fit this into my bigger picture of maths. And this all makes me very happy. Um, so that was my attempt at making a nicer argument relating to uh, this, making me feel better about this proof. So we had all these conjectures earlier on, and you have more conjectures that were on the chat, and I'm sorry that I didn't get them all. Let's give ourselves a tick for this one, because we've done this one as well. There are lots more things to say, because we have not completely answered this question yet. Some of you were talking about things like primes, three and seven seems important. If we knew which primes were sums of two squares, that would be really helpful. We can partly answer this question on the basis of what we've got already. We can't fully answer it. Uh, that would take a bit longer than we've got now. My cat's come to help, but that's not really useful. Hold on, cat. It'll be tea time soon. Um, there is more to think about than this question. I'm just going to leave that with you because I hope it'll, if you're interested that you could uh, enjoy going and thinking about them more. Um, James and I were comparing notes the other day, so uh, he's got some exciting things to put in the further reading. If you enjoyed exploring some number theory today and playing around with some data and trying to make some conjectures and trying to prove them. And you enjoy spending an hour doing that. And you think, gosh, I wish I could spend six weeks doing that in Oxford this summer. Well, maybe you can, Ta -da! Uh, because there's this program we run called Promise Europe, um, which is a six week residential summer program um, held at the Maths Institute and at Wadham College at the University of Oxford. Um, I'm the executive director. That's what I spend my summer doing. Um, for students from across Europe to come and hang out thinking really, really hard about maths, especially number theory, lots of focus on you discovering things for yourselves. Um, it, you have to be age at least 16 at the start of the programme. That's a rule. And you can't have started university yet. That's a rule. Um, we don't have that many places compared with how many mathematical teams teenagers there are you have to apply the closing date is the 13th of March but part of the application process is you try our set of challenging problems um there are 10 of them I think um so I hope you enjoy trying the challenging problems you need to look at them now they will take you time do not look on the 12th of March and think oh yeah I remember the deadlines tomorrow I'll just do these that won't work out it, uh you won't have enough time look at the problems now even if you don't want to spend six weeks this summer doing maths because you've got other plans you might still enjoy doing the application problems. We think they're interesting questions. We hope you will too. There is a cost for it because we have to pay for things like accommodation and food and other things. We really heavily subsidize the program for everyone. There is a cost, but we are really committed as a program to the principle that nobody should be unable to apply for financial reasons. So don't be put off by the cost. Once we've made offers of places to people on academic basis, um, people could students can then apply for financial aid if their family wouldn't be able to support them attending otherwise and we can give full or partial financial aid accordingly so please don't worry about the money uh, if you think you'd like to do the maths then please have a look and think about applying it would be fantastic to see you there I know that last year at least one of the students who came um, to our Promise Europe and maybe more had been involved with the Oxford Online Maths Club previously 
Uh, so that's my little sales pitch. Thank you so much for joining in um, today. I've loved working on this with you. I hope you found it interesting. I think James has some more important things to say to you before we wrap up. And hopefully I've left him enough time, maybe. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I love Promise Europe. I think it's a really good programme. Um, I want to stress from, from last year, I think we forgot to say, or we didn't make it clear enough, but, so I want to say it this time. Um, the application is completely free and the problems that are set for the application um, there are some problems to try. They're quite good. They're quite fun. Um, you could even have a look at them. They're free and on the internet. You could even have a look at them if you're not going to apply for Promise Europe. Um, and we'll have a link to that in the further reading if you want to try out their problems. Um, it, it is free to apply. They want to take people for the course and then work out uh, the financial aid afterwards. Um, I, I want to advertise the thing as well. It's a different course. Um, this one's completely free. Uh, it's for UK state state school students. Um, it's called Unique Unique 2022. Um, it's an online course and a bit of a residential course in Oxford for a few days um, to do bits and pieces of mathematics and to find out more about applying to Oxford. If you think that you might be interested in studying maths at university, um, possibly at Oxford, and you would like to find out more about that, then this whole program is supposed to be a way for you to find out more about Oxford, to explore things and to get help preparing and applying for university. Um, we're going to put links in the further reading. I might put links in the YouTube description as well. Just links generally everywhere. Sometimes James lets me join in with Unique and I get to do maths with Unique people. Unique's really great. And sometimes Vicky lets me speak briefly at Promise as well. <laughs> so um, uh, Unique, if you want to do a summer school with, if you want to do a summer school with Vicky, then Hey, you promise Europe, if you want to do a summer school with me, hey, Unique is happening as Absolutely well. Absolutely not a popularity contest. <laughs> Can you do both? I think they're both, I think they're at the same time. Yeah, you can't do both, I'm afraid. Probably they they coincide in time. Uh, somebody from Unique, so Molly, this is the lovely thing about Oxford Online Maths Club. Uh, Molly is here, Molly was here last year as well. Molly says, do Unique, I did it last year and it was so good. Thank you, Molly, for that endorsement. Um, uh, Alfie applied to this yesterday. Um, is Promise Europe just for Europe, Vicky? There's a question in chat. Uh, yeah, so it's students ordinarily resident in Europe, which includes all countries bordering the Mediterranean for our purposes. And England. <laughs> and so, so this is Europe in the geographical sense, not in the political sense. So I don't mean EU, I mean Europe. So definitely anybody who is ordinarily resident in the UK is really welcome. And yeah, you can absolutely apply for both and then kind of see what happens and potentially make a decision when you've had the outcome of your applications. Cool. More link links to both of these things will appear in various places, including the further reading. I haven't mentioned the further reading yet. Every week for the Oxford Online Maths Club, we put further reading on the Maths Club website. The Maths Club website is down there, down there somewhere, and link in the description. Um, it's also where you can stream 26 past episodes of Oxford Online Maths Club fun. If you want to find out, we've got previous episodes talking about complex numbers, prime numbers, quadratic residues. Things I did like another that. one that was a number theory one. Oh yeah, we might have proved something with complex numbers at one point as well. There've been yeah other things going on as well. Um, can, I, can I? If promise is hard to get into, should I apply for both? You might. You can. You can apply for both. They're both free to apply for. Both yeah, free. go for it. The promise one involves doing some maths problems. Um, they've got some tricky maths problems for you to do. The unique one is not just for maths people. It's for people across lots of subjects. So unique is uh, unique is more people. We've got. Uh, I think last year we had. More than a one, more than a thousand five hundred people involved on the unique course. Um, so it's a bit bit bigger. Um, people say thank you and people say bye. Um, I think we're going to call it uh, around about there. Thank you very much for watching. Um, we're going to be back at the same time, or I'm going to be back at the same time next week, uh, five o'clock on Thursday, for another episode of the Oxford Online Math Club. Joined by, I think one of our current students is going to be on to talk about some mathematics. I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you again to Vicky. Thanks to. Uh, Thanks to, I was going to say thanks to Vicky's cats as well for being here too. Um, thanks for sharing stuff with Squares. Um, more stuff in the further reading. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, take care. Have a nice, have a nice evening. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.